We are transformed from children of darkness into children of light. And we take on, the Bible says in Peter, that we become partakers of the divine nature. We actually get our father's nature rather than the nature of our earthly father. When we get born again, we take on the nature of of our heavenly father. Yes. So all the hard work is done. Yes. When I got born again and when you got born again, we had a nature change. Yeah. And with natures are all the wants and desires and drives. So the Bible says the yeah. spirit that we've been given lusts. It lusts against the flesh. So we have a spirit and lust just means strongly desires, wants, right? right. So we used our spirit was dead so we were controlled only by the lusts of the flesh but when we are born again our spirit is the dominant force filled with the Holy Spirit and we have brand new desires God desires and they're excellent they're amazing and they're unfathomable unfathomable to those who are not yet saved how did you do that how did you change like that what course did you take I need some of that Jesus Jesus Because I've tried many, many times to turn over new leaves before receiving the Spirit of Christ. And it just did not last. I did not have the energy and the substance within my flesh and my soul to maintain permanent change from addiction. And even if I did, it wasn't from the core. There was still a want from it, but there was a depriving of it. There was a reigning me in. There was an imprisoning of myself. So that I wouldn't do that thing. But the, the desire was strongly there. Yeah. When we get born again, this is the incredible thing. The desire for it leaves. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Cool. Now, what can remain is a, an addiction. An addiction or a habit in this yeah. thing. Yeah. But the desire for it goes. Yeah. So when I was born again, the desire for many evil things, many bad things. Because I was living the full life of a sinner as were we all before Christ. That many, many just left. They, I mean, all the desires left. But even the, the what, the just the motivation to do it anymore, it just went. Yeah. Then there were other things such as cigarette smoking. So I started smoking cigarettes. I was given my first cigarette at 11, and then by the time I was 14, I was smoking around a pack a day. So I had developed a habit, yeah. an addiction of my flesh, where within a certain period of time. My flesh was trained to start inhaling, to start sucking back on that cigarette. So when I didn't get it, I would get aggravated. I would get G. I would get angry because my flesh was now beginning to demand it. And uh, when I got born again, the want to smoke cigarettes, the want to do anything that was damaging to myself or others, left me. But that habit, I could not shake it for the life of me. So I'm preaching to everybody about Jesus, sucking back in my seekies. And I was like, God, this is so bad. I'm telling everybody about Jesus, and then I'm even hiding it. I'm going away because I'm trying to be a good Christian, so I'm hiding in secret, sucking back in my seekies. And it just was embarrassing, and I <laughs> swearing was another one of just the habit of swearing, yeah. Yeah. which come out at the worst times, yeah. or a car would go past me and the middle finger would come out before I even thought about it. Some of these things were habits. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so this is where I first learned these principles, mm. was with cigarettes. Because I really, I didn't want it. Yeah. The want was gone, but the addiction was there. Yeah. So That's what good. do I do? Yes. This is what I do, and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> so I have then done that. I'm now, next month, I've been with Christ 30 years. <laughs> so, yeah. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. And I have continually done this because this is what the Lord gave me for 30 years and have continuously broken any addiction that my flesh developed or had that was not pleasing to the Lord. And I've continued to do it. In fact, I'm going to share a testimony of probably, I don't know, a bunch of things that I've, I've broken addictions from even this year. Because you can, yeah. uh, yeah. just even over a Christmas holiday or something, you can pick up some things yeah. that really you're want, you don't want them. You yeah. just started doing them. Yeah. And now already, so quickly, they say it takes about 10 days, you picked it up. Yeah. And now it's a habit. It's like, oh, was that 10 days? Yeah, six weeks of holidays. And oh, no, now I'm stuck in it. Well, this is these some keys. Yeah. Yeah. The first thing was I agreed with God that this was not good for me. I was the temple of the most high God. 
God's spirit was evidently living in him by all the changes and all the beauty and all the wonder and all the amazing stuff that was now coming out of my life instinctively. And yet here I am with the temple of God filling it with cigarette smoke. Peter Jackson's back in the day. I don't know who this Peter Jackson. <laughs> yep. I started on the Mentos, mate, and I was addicted to those things. Just even with the flavor. It's like vaping now. I could just even get the flavor of those things. Anyways. So the first thing I needed to do, the first thing you need to do, which really is repentance. Yeah. Repentance is actually, if you look up the word, it's, it's about the mind. Yeah. Repentance literally means, you look at the Greek definition, to think differently. Yeah. Yes. We think repentance is saying sorry. Yeah. But they understood repentance of you're thinking wrong. Yeah. And you're totally wrong because the creator knows right. So at some point or another, you're going to decide, I'm going to think like God thinks, but I'm going to stay an idiot. Because that's what it is. The Creator knows everything. He created us and everything out there. His mind is the only sane mind. He has the right mind. So repentance means turning away from thinking you know something when you don't and getting in agreement with the mind of your Creator and saying, you're right, I'm wrong. That is repentance. So the first thing I did is I agreed with God. Repentance means to think differently. To stop thinking this thing is good but to agree with God that it is not good and that I genuinely desire to be free from it and to live God's way instead. So I agree with his mindset about it, that he wanted me free from this thing. He wanted, I pictured myself not needing cigarettes, going half a day, going to the afternoon, going to the evening, going a full day without sucking back on a cigarette and not being mad. And I was like, that looks good. That looks good. To be able to walk around preaching to people, my breath doesn't smell like cigarettes. Smoke. Yeah. This would be good. Yeah. I'm looking forward to this. So that was step one. That's repentance. I agree with you, God, that this has got to go. This is not good. I don't want it. You don't want it. Let's do it. Yeah. Step number two. Ask him for his grace to help you break free from the power of addiction. Now, this is the step that unbelievers don't do. Because they don't want to humble themselves and trust in God. Yeah, that's right. So they then go from, I, I agree that it's wrong, what, what do I have to do about it? How am I going to break this addiction? Now, I'm not saying that can't be done. Obviously, there's people out there who do it. It's just very hard. It's very hard. It's taxing. It's tedious. And yet the Bible says that when we do it not by might and not by power, but by the Spirit, it's easy. And beyond that, it's eternal. It's lasting. It's not something that two months later you're going to find yourself back in it and you're like, oh. So even when you're breaking out of it, making new decisions, you subconsciously know I'll be back at it in a minute. It's not like that when it's done with God. Amen. So we need to actually humble ourselves and go from agreeing with him, not into what am I going to do about it. We go from agreeing into, God, I need your grace. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Now grace means many things, but basically it's all of God's provision for you. It's his extreme generosity towards anything that you could ever have need of. As your doting, loving, absolutely cherishing heavenly father. That is his grace. So that is what he calls his throne. It's the throne of grace. Right? Which you just come boldly before it because that's what it's it's there. God wants to give you everything that you need on, as true. your heavenly father. Yeah. That's right. You come so therefore come boldly that you may obtain mercy, which is what we need, right? Yeah. Help God. Yeah. Help. I need mercy. Yeah. And find the grace to help you in your come time on. of need. Yeah. yeah, come on. If you go so from good. agreeing with God that it's bad to trying hard, you are in religion. That is what the Bible calls the works of the flesh or the arm of the flesh. The Bible says, I believe it is, um, maybe earlier in Hebrews 4, 
But it talk, is that where it talks about the rest, entering the rest then? Or is that Romans? No, that is Hebrews. Entering the rest. And so somewhere in there, in that entering the rest, it talks about he who enters God's rest has ceased from his own works, ceased from his own effort, from his own labor, from his own trying. When you enter rest, and rest is living in the Spirit. It's just letting the Spirit of God do the work. Now, we're going to talk about what that looks like. It's all woo-woo, you know, like just call upon God to help and then sweat. Now I just can go do what I'm going to do. We'll go into step number three. But this step number two is crucial, and this is the humbling one, and this is the stumbling block for most people. They don't want to ask for God's help because it was bad enough that they had to ask God's help to get saved. So for them, they go, right, that was enough though. That was, I got into heaven through God's mercy. That's it. But now I'm going to prove to God that it wasn't a waste of his time. I'm going to, I'm going to pay it back to God. I'm going to show him. I'm going to be his best kid. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to. That is religion. Because the same way you got saved by grace through faith is the same way you're meant to live. Every day of your life and every part of your life. There is no place for you performing before God. That is unacceptable to God. The Bible says all of your good deeds, all of your performance is like filthy rags before him. It counts for nothing. The only works that God accepts is the works that he does. That's why I win. That makes it easy. Yeah, he already on. accepts you through the work that Christ did. And every work that you do, you don't do it. The Spirit of Christ does it through you. Because if you do do it yourself, it counts for nothing. Anything that you conjure up for yourself counts for nothing. It's a dead work, a work of the flesh, a work of religion. The only works God's impressed with are the works that He does. By His Spirit in your life and through you. So good, yeah. But it is him doing it. Yeah. We are his workmanship. That's he's doing all the all the glory always goes to him. Yes. Let's turn to Isaiah and chapter 40. We'll go on to step number three. Does anyone have any idea what we might do after we've asked God for grace? What might be step number three? Obedience. Mm-hmm. Right. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's co- that's coming in. That's the fortifying stage. Wait. Wait. <laughs> I know that's not what you want to hear. No. But it's actually wait on His grace to kick in. Okay. Yeah, you've asked for it. Now you've got to wait for it. So I agree with God that cigarette smoking was bad. I asked for help. And then I kept smoking. And you're like, oh, sinner. No, because I was like, what I'm not going to do is do it by might and do it by power. It's not going to last. I've tried that. This is so good, baby. I've tried that. Praise God. It doesn't work. And I'm not justifying you if you're like, oh, me. Now I'm going to stay in my seat for the next 10 years. No. No. Because God loves you. He's not going to leave you in it for 10 years. When you've asked for grace, His grace is going to kick in. But you're going to wait for it. You see, the boys after Jesus had ascended, um, they were ready to go. They were ripped more and ready to go. We've seen you, Lord. We've seen the resurrection. We've seen everything. God still said, wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit's power. He is going to endue you with the power to be my witnesses. But they're like, dude, dude, we got this. We got this. But you know what? They didn't because they'd all fallen short. They'd all already betrayed Jesus and failed Jesus. So they knew not to rely on themselves. So when Jesus said, wait, they waited. They waited. They just waited for the Holy Spirit's endowment of power. That's what we need to do in every area of our lives. We wait. Isaiah in chapter 40 says... Hast thou not known, and hast, oh, verse 28, sorry. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the, re, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, faints not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Verse 29, he gives power to the faint 
And to them that have no might, he increases their strength. When you're like, I literally can't break this addiction, God. You're in a good place. Yeah. He doesn't want you conjuring it up. He wants you doing what we're reading about here. Because even you grow addicted. They grow faint. They're trying to break it, but they grow faint and weary. Young men shall utterly fall. I cannot kick this habit. This goes across the board. Yeah. This is not just for older. This, the Bible says it's for young. Yeah. But listen what the answer, what his answer is. They that wait upon the Lord, they wait for the endowment of power by the Spirit of God. They wait for the grace. Come on. They shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. This is God's answer. And this continues our walk of humility and dependence. There's no point at which we go, yeah, I've got it now, Lord. You're taking too long. I'll just take it from here. Yeah, help yourself. Help yourself. Saul, did you say? Yeah, yeah. Saul, uh, great example. There's plenty of examples in the Bible. Saul certainly did it. The prophet said, wait, he did it away. It didn't turn out so well for him, did it? He lost the whole kingdom that day. God says, wait, it keeps us in that state of humility and dependence. But let it be known, it is not a hopeless state. It is full of expectation, full of anticipation, filled with hope. I cannot wait. Any minute now, the grace is going to kick in and it's on like Donkey Kong. See you later, devil. Enjoy your last few moments because it's it's over. When the God kicks in, it is on. It's on, man. Yes, it's good. Wait on the grace of God. You know, I've shared many times that when I was in labor with my first child and I didn't know what to expect, between contractions, pushing contractions, um, it was just taking a while. I was like, can we just get done already? Because the contractions were still, you know, kind of spaced apart. In fact, I was quite spaced apart even though I was pushing. Like eight minutes apart, say. And I'm just like, uh, I want everything now. I'm that kind of a girl. So I'm like, you know, he's partially out. Can we just get it done? So I said, can I just push him out? And the midwife said, you can try. <laughs> and I put all my effort, probably burst a few blood vessels, and nothing yeah. happened. Yeah. Nothing. Not even a millimetre. Yeah. <laughs> and then a few minutes later, when I just was exhausted and slumped back on the bed and then the contraction came, took over my whole body, yeah. he came out in one more solid push. Yeah. Oh, flipping, he was long, man. He was an octopus, that kid, when he came out. <laughs> Dude, my body did it. When the grace came, yeah. he just Ooh. came. Yeah. We need to learn to have patience wow. and wait on the Lord. Wow. All throughout the Bible, this is a reoccurring theme. Wow. Wait on the Lord. Yeah. That shows humility, dependence, and faith in God, wow. not faith and dependence. On yourself. Amen? Love it. Number four. So number one is? Agree with God. Yay! One person taking notes. Go, Rev. Number two. Ask for help. Yeah, Ask go, Rev. Number three. Wait. Wait. Oh, you've got that one. Wait on the grace. Wait on the grace to kick in. Okay. And number four, I won't ask you. Or shall I ask you? Anyone want to have a go? Anyone want to have a go at number four? Rejoice. Yeah, <laughs> that's good too. Go with the grace. Go with the grace. Okay, let's turn to Matthew 11. So you've agreed with God. You've asked God to give you his grace to help you to break free from it. Then you've waited on it, and it suddenly kicks in. Now, you know what? I'm going to jump over to you this bit, while you guys are looking that up. How to know when the grace is actually there. That's good. Now, this is really, really easy. Uh, But you may never have recognized this, so this may be very educational for you, and very, very helpful to understand this. Um, In fact, before, just read it. No, I will read it. Okay. okay. How to know when the grace is in? Really simple. Who's seen Lord of the Rings? Because I'm going to use a Lord of the Rings reference. Me. Yeah. Okay. It's when the precious stops loving you back. Okay? The thing that you love, the thing that you're addicted to, 
it stops all of a sudden loving your back. It doesn't give you the buzz it used to. It's no longer working for you. It just doesn't do for you what it used to do. In fact, it may begin to cause something that you're not enjoying. That thing, just yesterday, it was great, and today you do it and you feel sick. Physically nauseous or sick of soul. You may do it the next day and you just, it's boring. Like this seriously used to give you such a buzz and just like out of nowhere, it's just like, this is so boring. Yeah. It's super lame. You do it, you get a headache. Like literally, as you're doing it, out of nowhere, a headache starts to come upon you. Like you, you're going to go away and you're going to start noticing these things now. When you're doing something that's, 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 in fact, we'll get back to that, but yeah. You are going to find things that you don't want to do from your spirit, but you're doing. When the grace kicks in, they start to hurt you. They don't love you back. You feel guilty. You feel dirty. You didn't used to, but now you do. You feel ripped off. I mean, this could be something as simple as an addiction to this. You can't stop yourself from being on it. Started when you first got it, oh yeah, I'll just use it to pay the bills and call you when I need. Next minute, four hours a day. Check your thing and it says six hours a day. Seven hours a day and you're like, how did I clock up that last time? Well, that's not good. That's how we should treat it, Ken. Just like that, brother. Throw it on the phone, huh? Yeah, I mean, look, they got that place, but again, it's when it can become an addiction. And you know, what I mean by ripped off is you start finding yourself, you're on this thing six hours a day without even realising it, and now you're at night kissing your babies to sleep and they're sound asleep, and you're looking at them going, dude, I was so ripped off from you today. I, I barely touched you. I barely spoke to you. I barely enjoyed you, and now you look so beautiful, sleeping with your mouth open and drool coming out. <laughs> Just, I miss you. And you start feeling ripped off Come on, it's good. by something that you once could be a game that you just addicted to. Yeah. So on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, whatever it is, but that thing that you used to love, you're now feeling ripped off by. It. You could be going out for a couple with your spouse or whatever, and but that thing just keeps calling you, and you can't stop yourself from answering and checking and doing this and that. But you're driving back from the cover and you feel ripped off. Yeah. Even on my date, even on our cover time, I just couldn't stop myself. Right. You start feeling robbed of living and experiencing. Whatever it is, it's starting to take you away from your kids, from your time with your spouse, your parents, your siblings, your friends, whatever it is. I mean, I often see this when I'm out and about. I'll see families at playgrounds. And there's little kids, they're literally like three, four years of age, running around, doing all this stuff, and the parents are walking behind them. What? Yeah. I'm like, dude, I am so glad we didn't have these when our kids were young. Um, because we went to the park. We went to the park. We went to the beach. We went to the beach. We went out. We went out. Like, I learned, because as a minister, I did get given a phone fairly early on in the early days, but I knew within like two weeks of trying to have a phone near me when I was homeschooling, I just couldn't do it. I had to put that thing on mute or whatever and just say only Ryan's calls would be accepted during the whole day of my homeschooling. Maybe at lunch I might do something, but even then it would start pulling me in a direction and I wanted to be able to give my very best to my kids because I started noticing I'd get real agitated with them. It's funny, I used to really enjoy sitting there with them at the table, but if I start trying to do more than a couple of things at once, now I'm starting to lash out at them, now I'm starting to lose my patience, yeah. I'm getting frustrated because I'm split. And I began to realise I can't have visitors at my house during homeschool. Yeah. I can't have my phone on during homeschool. Right. I, I had to realise my own limits because I wanted to be able to give my very best to my children. So good, yeah. yeah. Are you being robbed? Is this thing starting to rob you? And you're recognising you, it gets to the point when the grace has kicked in, you don't even want that thing anymore, but you can't stop yourself. It's now a habit. You no longer desire it, 
You desire freedom. Okay, this is when all of these things, and then we could go into heaps more, but these are all signals that God's grace is kicking. You're like, no, I thought like just power would come upon me and I just put on a cape and I'd be like, no, no, no. The majority of the way God does it is by these type of things. All the winking at. He says in his word that he used to, um, I'm just trying to think of the scripture how it goes. Where's my fire? She's like in the corner. She's gracious. Anyway, it says there was a time when God would wink at those things. As in turning his eye away from what I don't see. But then there's a time he goes, okay, we're addressing this one now. When God, he's, because when you first got saved, there's a, there's a lot of areas to deal with, right? Because everything's wrong. Right? So he doesn't do it all at once. He starts with one thing at a time. But when he's coming after something, he's no longer looking away from that thing. He now puts his full attention on it and you feel it. Because any grace or any leniency that was there is now lifted and you just feel the full brunt of that thing. So with me with cigarettes, I had agreed with God that it wasn't good for me, it wasn't his will for me and I didn't want it. I asked him for his grace and I kept smoking and then I waited on his grace to kick in. Now, I began to draw back on my cigarette and I started noticing, I started feeling a little bit nauseous. I kept drawing back, I finished that ciggy, the next ciggy, even a little bit more nauseous. I kept I kept going for a few weeks. I was pushing this thing. Well, I didn't even want to do it anymore. And I'm feeling nauseous, but I'm like, no, I will do it. I, I even in my mind it was like a limiting belief. I can't break free from this. This even though God is giving me all the help that I need now. Because I hate throwing up far more than I love drawing back on a cigarette. Far more. In fact, I really don't like throwing up. So God's really helping me. All the grace has gone. I am now feeling like throwing up. I, it got to the point, though, that dominated me. I would go to suck back and I literally started dry reaching. And I'm like, hey, okay, there's no denying the grace has kicked in. Dad, stop smoking. Now, you will not believe that then when I went into my exam, exams, end of year exams two years later, I asked mum for cigarettes again and started smoking. The good news is, <laughs> I did it, I literally did it just for my exams and I hated it. It actually gave me a head spin now because I've been off with it so long and it was tripping me out and I was like, yeah, thank God I don't want these anymore. Can't believe you bought them for me though, mum. That was sin. <laughs> Better that you buy them than I bought them for myself, I suppose. Far too expensive. Anyways. <laughs>